Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the, so the showroom here at Roth Living in beautiful Denver, Colorado. And welcome to this um, edition of the ownership class for the Wolf Convection Steam Oven. We're so glad that you're able to join us today to learn about the use and care of this really remarkable appliance. My name is Executive Chef Ben Davis. Actually, my whole name is not Executive Chef, but my name is Ben Davis, and I'm the chef here at the showroom in Denver. And we're certainly glad that you could join us today to learn about this appliance. So um, this is uh, uh, our first um, YouTube broadcast. So um, I hope that everybody was able to find the link okay and that you're um, getting a nice clean feed um, from us here at the uh, Culinary Scene Studio Kitchen. Um, you know, you have a chat feature on your YouTube uh, link, so please, when you have a question today, we'd love it, just type the question into the chat feature and then it will be relayed directly to me and we'll try to make sure that we first repeat the question um, and so you know it's your question that's being answered um, and then I'll try to answer that as we go through the presentation today. So um, just make sure you just uh, you know ask those questions. Put your name in there is always a good idea so you know if uh, it helps me to identify uh, those questions and all of those good things um, as we go through it. Today we're going to talk about not just how to use this fantastic appliance, but also um, how to maintain it, how to care for it, how to clean it. That's obviously going to be very important to many people. Um, but what you really want to know is how this appliance is going to benefit you in your kitchen. And I can tell you right now that um, the Wolf Convection Steam Oven, once you've got it installed, will become your go-to appliance um, whenever you've got something going on in the kitchen. You're going to use it for everyday preparations, and then you're gonna use it for those special occasions, whether it's a birthday or a holiday meal, something really important, you're gonna use this appliance because it really opens up so many opportunities and possibilities for you when you're in the kitchen. So we'll get started by talking about just how this appliance goes together, what makes it so unique, um, and then we'll talk about the specific cooking modes, how you can use it um, in the kitchen, and all of those things, and then and when we're done with that, um, We'll give some uh, talk about the gourmet feature um, and all of those great things that come with it. So just so you know, be on the lookout in the future. You are going to get an email probably in the next 24 to 48 hours. That email is going to include a separate link so you can revisit this broadcast as a recorded copy. You can go back and, and check it out again if you want to, but you'll also be getting some recipes um, and some other documents that we like to provide um, our, our Sub-Zero and Wolf and Cove owners, particularly Sub-Zero or Wolf Convection Steam Oven owners with some documentation that I will refer to today that you're going to find that's going to be really helpful for you going forward. So keep an eye out um, for your email, in your email for the next couple of days because that's going to show up for you there as well. All right. Okay. So let's just talk a little bit about the Wolf Convection Steam Oven. It's right here behind me. Um, and in fact, it's uh, in, a, in a cooling mode. We've just used it to, to roast this chicken, right? But we're going to talk about just how this amazing little appliance goes together. Now, if you look at it here on the wall behind me, you see that it matches nicely with the speed oven that is below it. Um, this is an appliance that in reality is only 24 inches wide, but we can trim it to make it look 30 inches so that it'll blend in with whatever other appliance you pair it with. Um, and I would say that uh, most of our customers now are pairing the convection steam oven with a larger format convection oven. So they really have the best of both worlds um, when you're talking about um, the different things you can do in these ovens. So convection steam oven here trimmed to look 30%. This is the Pro Series, M Series um, version with the little heavier handle um, there. But again, trimmed to look um, to match with um, what's right below it. So convection steam oven, how does it work? How does it function, right? So the first word you notice in that is steam, right? Obviously not every oven produces steam. This oven can do that completely on its own, using steam as part of the cooking process should you choose to use it, okay? Now, why is steam so important in a convection steam oven? Well, let's think about it from a practical point of view. You know, if I'm cooking in an oven, right, and it's been at 425 degrees, right, all I have to do is protect my hand with a towel. I can reach into that oven, remove the food from that oven, right? 425 degrees. None of us give it a second thought. As long as our hand is protected, we're not 
worried about putting our hand in that very hot oven. However, if I have a pot of boiling water on the stove, I'm not reaching across that stream of, of steam because I know that's going to scald my skin. Well, boiling water, 212 at its hottest temperature. 212 is considerably cooler than 425. Right? What's that teaching us if we're afraid of the 212 but not of the 425? Water vapor is so much more efficient at moving heat from the appliance to the food, so therefore it will cook faster and more efficiently. Right? We can use that uh, to our benefit when we can combine that, that efficiency of water vapor cooking and the moisture that it provides, when we can combine that with high temperature dry air cooking, convection cooking, now we get the best of both worlds. And so that's what the Wolf convection steam oven does for you. It combines those two items together should you choose to use that, those modes so that you can get the best of both worlds, right? And the nice part about it is in our version of a convection steam oven, because yes, there are other models out there from other manufacturers, right? Slightly different um, interfaces, slightly different uh, the ways you can use them. But one of the things that we've determined in ours is that we didn't make it so that you can program this appliance so that you get 20% humidity for 15 minutes. No, 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 no. We want to teach you that when you're using the convection steam mode, now you've got about 65% humidity. That's helping you cook. You don't have to guess what it's going to be doing. Do I need this much steam or that much steam? You're going to let the oven do that for you once you understand how it works. So that's one of the beauties of the Wolf convection steam oven. It's, it's much more about ease of use rather than the technologically advanced um, features that you might find in some other ovens. This is going to make it much easier for you to use and to understand. All right. So steam and dry air used together, right? They can be independent of one another, just dry air, convection, or it can be just steam, and then there are those combination modes as well. So let's just talk about how this oven goes together. We'll open it up and you can see the interior. Um, in this oven, you have essentially two heating elements in the oven, one below the oven floor, the other surrounding the singular convection fan that is located at the back of the oven. So when we're using convection heat, that's where the heat is being produced primarily, right? Um, but the beautiful, the beautiful thing about this, having those two individual heating elements, is now we can control the temperature in single degree um, increments so that you can program it to a low or high temperature, whatever you want, right? And make sure that that oven is completely uh, operating at that temperature, right? Even if you're using pure steam, right? A lot of other ovens, the steam provides the heat. In this case, the steam is providing the humidity and not the heat. The oven is being heated by those two elements so we can control it and then we can introduce steam should we need to if we're using it, all right? So two elements under the floor and in the back. The steam is introduced through a small emitter that's in the ceiling of the oven, right? So to have steam, you need to have water, right? Where does the water come from in the Wolf Convection steam oven? Well, here's another aspect of it that I really appreciate. The reservoir where the water is stored in the oven is external from the oven cavity. So in other words, if you do run out of water, and we're gonna talk about that in a second, but if you do run out of water, you don't have to open the oven door, which would release not only steam and humidity from the oven, but would also lower the temperature. It might decrease the temperature. That's not good. We want to not have to do that when we need to add water. So where is that reservoir located? It's located right here behind this panel. And by pressing the water button, it opens the reservoir, slides it out, and then you see behind the panel is the reservoir itself. So you just fill this reservoir with water from your kitchen tap. You don't need any specialized water, no distilled, demineralized, deionized. You just need to fill it from your tap. Very important. The only exception to that would be those of you who might own a reverse osmosis whole home water filtration system. If you have that type of system in your home, right, you're going to need to add very small amounts, and we're talking like a tablespoon of 
a bottled water. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, just it can be, you know, just a bottle of water um, from your fridge. Just put a tablespoon into the reservoir with the water from your kitchen tap. This is because the water that is normally from your tap, right, even when it's, when it's not RO filtered, right, has trace amounts of minerality in it. It's the minerals in the water, right, that help the oven function properly when it runs out of water. When the oven runs out of water, those minerals remain in the boiler system, right? And they alert the oven that there is no water remaining in the reservoir and therefore stop making steam because you can't make steam when you don't have water. And we don't want to try to boil something that's not there. It could damage the internal componentry of your oven. So you need that mineral content in your water so that it will activate the sensors so that your oven will function properly. So tap water is ideal, provided it's not reverse osmosis fil filtered. If, if, if that is the case for you, then just add a little bit of bottled water to the res uh, reservoir every time you add it. Now, what happens when you run out of water, right? You're cooking along, right? You're cooking some vegetables, maybe you're steaming some seafood and you run out of water and you're running a timed feature in the oven. And what is going to happen? Well, it's going to happen is that the oven is going to pause. It's going to pop the drawer out like this. It's going to chime gently and it will give you an, a visual message. Please refill the reservoir. If you are running a timed process in your oven, it will pause at the exact moment that it ejected the drawer and stopped making steam. And as long as I don't open the oven door, I lose no humidity and no temperature from my internal oven cavity until I refill the water into the reservoir, reinsert the drawer, and at, at that point it will just pick up and keep going. So you don't have to worry if you're out of the room for a couple of minutes, your oven will continue to maintain its temperature and humidity even while the um, drawer is ejected and when you're ready to refill it. So it's, it's got that nice fail safe feature on it. You don't have to worry that if you're in another part of the home when you run out of water. But when you are steaming, right, in the oven, this full reservoir will provide you about two and a half hours of continuous steam so that you can just keep on uh, going. If you're doing a lot of vegetable steaming, you're steaming uh, maybe lots of seafood to make a salad or something like that. Like, along those lines, you can go two and a half hour hours at the highest temperature of pure steam, 100% humidity um, whilst you're steaming. So you know that you have a good long time before you're gonna need to refill the reservoir. If you're using other modes that require either a lower temperature or lesser amounts of steam, the steam will be produced for a much longer period of time than just than that two and a half hours. Um, good example of this might be if you were doing a sous vide process at a lower temperature in the oven, say 135 degrees, um, in order to manufacture the steam for that temperature of oven, because you have less evaporation uh, of the water, this, that, that um, reservoir could last easily six to 10 hours before you need to refill it. So it'll last a long time when you have the water in there. So that's where the water comes from. Um, it's gonna be stored here in the reservoir. And now you know all about that, okay? All right, let's talk about this interface and how this works for you. So let's just turn the oven off for a second. Just press the power button. So when you approach the oven, when you're ready to cook it uh, in it for the first time of the day, you're gonna walk up, it's gonna be this empty uh, screen right here in the middle with just the clock illuminated, right? To activate the oven, to turn the oven on, if you will, you simply need to touch any one of the icons or the words on this front panel. You just touch any one, you can just touch the favorite thing and automatically it will illuminate this panel. First things first, this is not a touch screen. You can bang on that all day long. Nothing's going to happen except maybe you'll get a little sore finger. That's all it's gonna do. You can't scroll back and forth on this screen. Um, so just remember it's just there for display and information and letting you know as how you progress through the process. But when you open up any one of these uh, icons, you're gonna get this screen and it says quick start. And then underneath it, it says steam. And then underneath the word steam, you have six boxes going across and from left to right. The first box is the steam setting. Second box will be convection. 
And in order to move the cursor, if you will, which are these dashed lines that are underneath those boxes, you simply touch these arrows, the little carrots, and it'll move it across. So there it goes, there's convection, move it again, convection steam, convection humid, reheat, and sous vide. So these in the quick start menu are sort of what I like to affectionately call the manual transmission. You're going to tell the oven, how would I like you to cook my food? Then you will tell it how hot you would like the oven to be and for how long you would like the oven to do that cooking, right? You simply program those modes in these keys over here on the left, right? And then we can move forward. Yes, we have our first question. So that's a good question. So the question is, can I cook multiple pans of foods on different racks in the oven simultaneously and still have it cook evenly? This will partially depend on which cooking mode you are using, but let's just start um, very basic. If you're using the steam mode, yes, you can use multiple trays, multiple pans on up to, well, there's, it comes with two racks, but you could do on more than two racks if you're using steam mode, right? In convection mode, you're limited to two racks, but as many pans as you could fit on two racks. Um, convection steam, same true as convection. You could use up to two racks, but multiple pans on each rack. Um, same would be true of convection humid. So the answer is yes, you are not limited to a single rack of cooking in the oven. Um, your, the least number you could do would be um, uh, one. If you're doing multiples, then two for convection, convection steam, and convection humid. And if you're using steam as a mode, you can actually use four trays or racks simultaneously because of the nature of steam and its ability to envelop all the food that's being cooked. It cooks very evenly, even when you're using four racks. I hope that answers your question. But yes, you can definitely cook, bake, roast on multiple racks. It'll just depend on the size of the pans that you're inserting into the oven, um, which may be a limiting factor depending on the, the, the depth of those pans. All right. So again, the five modes or six modes, excuse me. Um, and then you will be determining temperature, the duration of that cooking time, and then you can program it to set an exact end time so that if you know that a certain item needs to be uh, cooked for a certain amount of time, you can set that end time so it will be done at that exact moment in time. Um, and I'll explain that in a little bit of time in just a second. So let's talk about how, um, that, how we program this and how the oven works. So let, let's start with the steam mode because that's really why a lot of people love this oven because it can make its own steam. Instead of having to boil a pot of water onto the stove, insert some sort of device in order to hold the food up above the boiling liquid so it's just in the steam, right? We can now do that purely in the oven without having to boil anything because the beauty of the steam mode is it never requires preheating. You simply place your food on a tray or in a pan or in some vessel and place it into the oven and then steam it. So let's just use that steam mode as an example of how you will program. And I, I don't want you to get intimidated by that word program because it sounds like it's very, very technical. It's really not. You just need to sort of know the order in which you need to tell the oven how you would like to cook, right? And you're gonna do that by simply using these two um, cursor buttons on the sides and then the enter button in between in order to program the oven, right? So now we've got the steam mode highlighted here on the extreme left, and we know that it's, that's the mode we're in because obviously it says it here, and then it also has the dashed line underneath that box indicating that we're in steam mode, all right? So if we know we wanna use steam, we're gonna touch enter in order to tell the oven, yes, we're gonna use steam. Now, the first screen that's gonna come up when you work forward in that um, quick start menu is this screen. It's going to say use rack position two or one to four in this case. So what that means is if I am cooking a single tray of something using the steam mode, the ideal spot is rack position two. And like almost every Wolf oven that you could buy right now, our racks are numbered from bottom to top. 
So you don't have to guess whether two is one down from the top or one up from the bottom. It's always going to be right there, one up from the bottom. So we always count bottom of the oven to the top. So one, two, three, and four. So rack position two is the ideal spot if I want to steam a single tray. But notice what it says after that, or one to four. What that means is, is that in, in steam mode, I am able to cook on all four racks simultaneously or anywhere in the oven, right? So if I just want to throw something in on rack position three, I can do that. Or I can use one, two, and three, or two, three, and four. It really doesn't matter. Okay, another question. If a recipe calls for blanching for one minute, uh -huh. can, the steam, can you steam the item for a minute and get the same results? That's a great question. So the question is, if a recipe instructs you to blanch an item, like some green beans or some asparagus or something along that line, and the recipe calls for a blanching in boiling water for one minute, how do I equate that to cooking in the steam oven? What I do when I am prepping vegetables, blanching items um, to be prepared for a salad or for later cooking, I always add just a little bit of time because when you're boiling in liquid, you're immersing them completely for that full minute in the oven, I would double that time. So if it says blanch for a minute, I would blanch for two minutes, right? If it said blanch for three minutes, I might blanch or might steam for six minutes. Um, the steam is almost instantaneous when you start the oven. However, there is a little bit of a lag time. So you want to give it just that little bit of extra time in order to blanch those vegetables. So add about a doubling of the amount of time you would take um, from your recipe. That's what been my um, experience with the oven. So I hope that answers that question. All right. So, so I can do back to the, this message, which is going to show up. It just tells me ideal position for one or how many racks can I do simultaneously? Steam is the only mode where I can use all four racks simultaneously. The other modes, convection, convection, humid, convection, steam, reheat, and sous vide, will limit you to two racks simultaneously. And generally speaking, those are rack positions one and three when I want to do multiple rack cooking um, in the oven in those other modes. But steam allows you all four simultaneously. Okay? So you're always going to have that screen is going to be the next screen when you move forward from the steam mode. You'll see this box at the bottom, which has the dashed lines underneath it with a small check mark in the middle. What that is telling you is that the oven is going to sit and do nothing, right? Until you press the enter button in order to move forward and continuing to program the oven. Okay. So it'll sit like this. It won't turn itself off. It won't turn itself on. It's just going to wait for you to tell it what you want to do next. Right? So when we talk about using those racks and the different, uh, cooking, uh, platforms that we have in the oven, you will all notice that you've gotten, uh, you've got uh, four trays or racks with your oven. You've got two trays like this, right? One is solid, one is perforated. Obviously the perforated one is really designed for steaming. Um, solid tray can be used for baking, for roasting, for, uh, you know, for braising, for anything like that, right? Um, generally speaking, um, when we use, um, when we're steaming, we like to use them in con concert with one another. Um, we put the, the food to be steamed on the perforated tray. That will go into that rack position above and then to catch some extra water in the oven. It's always a good idea to put this rack, this tray below it just to catch the excess water that condenses, especially if you're doing seafood, um, you'll get a little drip through um, the holes and it'll catch on this. So it'll keep it off the floor of your oven, right? So those come with your oven. You also get two wire racks, which are ideal for using when you are using your own cooking vessels, whether it's a Pyrex pan, a ceramic pan, a metal pan, right? There is no prohibition as to what you type of pan you can put into the convection steam oven. I wouldn't put any plastic in there unless I'm using a very low temperature, but any other form of cooking vessel is perfectly acceptable um, in the oven. Anything from cast iron to uh, stainless steel, you, I don't 
can't imagine you want to put a non-stick pan in there of any kind, but you know, you can put any of those items in there um, when you want to use them. Okay, so these are all designed exclusively for the CSO. They just slide right into these uh, rails on the side so they hold it nice and firmly, right? So and you can also use these to cook right on. We'll talk about that in just a little bit. But you get all of these. Now there is one other pan that you can order if you want. Um, Sub-Zero and Wolf, I use this pan. This is a just solid pan, but it's got a porcelain enamel coating on it. It's very nice for roasting. If you are interested in a pan like this, you can simply contact us here at Roth um, and we're happy to ship you one of these pans. But these are very handy for roasting meats and other vegetables. It's really a handy pan to have. I think they clean up a little bit better than the stainless steel ones do as well. All right. So again, back here to this point. So in this case, if I were steaming, I might place my solid pan in rack position one. Now, notice this side of the pan is a more vertical side and this pan is more angled. This side of the pan, the angled side faces the back of the oven, right? The oven will work fine if you put it in backwards. However, it is designed so that the beveled side goes to the back. So we're gonna slide this one if we were gonna steam into number one. And if we were steaming on this, we might put our vegetables, we might put our shrimp, whatever we're cooking, and we'll put that on number two, all right? Now remember, with steam, you don't need to preheat the oven. In fact, you shouldn't preheat the oven. So we wanna move forward. When we move to the next screen, now we're sort of on the clock because this oven has a countdown timer which is a series of hashes that move from left to right. And as they descend from left to right, when they get to the extreme right hand side, the oven will automatically turn itself on until, unless you make some keystrokes in order to make some alterations to temperature, to time, to end times, anything like that. So you'll just notice that when you move to the next screen, that's when if you need to make some adjustments, that's where you start making your adjustments. And the way we move to the next screen, obviously, touch the enter button. So we touch enter, and now it'll always open on this box, which says set temperature. That's the oven temperature, right? And it's, it's illuminated and it's got the dashed lines. If I would like to change the temperature of my oven, I press the enter button again. Now, what I get is a scale that shows me the temperature range for this particular cooking mode. So in the steam mode, I can make my oven as low as 90 degrees or as hot as 210 degrees, right? That's my range. Anywhere on that range in one degree increments, I can set my oven to function, all right? So obviously when we're cooking vegetables, when we're steaming vegetables, um, you wanna use the, the hottest temperature um, for cooking all your vegetables, which would be 210 degrees. Okay, if I move that temperature scale, temperature down, what would I use the lower temperatures for? Well, I personally like to do all my seafood, right? Whether it's shrimp, crab's legs, maybe it's some lobster tails, I'm gonna steam some salmon, some other sorts of fin fish. I like to use a light, slightly lower temperature, anywhere between 175 and 200 degrees, because I find this gives me the nicest results when I'm steaming my fish and my shrimp and my crab legs at those temperatures, they tend not to dry out, they tend not to overcook. I get a much more moist and tender product by setting that temperature. So I just scroll downwards to select that temperature. And once I've found that, I touch enter and that will lock in that particular temperature. Remember that even though the oven cavity in the steam setting is 100% humidified, right? 100% humidity, the temperature is controlled by those two elements. So I can get 100% humidity at 150 degrees, or I can get 100% humidity at 90 degrees, right? So it gives me a high, high moisture content, but a lower temperature for gentle, more, uh, you know, kind of regulated cooking if I use a lower temperature. So it's nice to be able to control that temperature and know that I have 100% humidity. Now, you might look at that scale and think to yourself, okay, chef, 90 degrees? What, what am I gonna cook at 90 degrees? Well, frankly, nothing, right? You're not gonna cook anything at 90 degrees. Well, if you are, it's gonna take a very, very long time. 
But what I can use steam, right, steam mode at that low end of the temperature range is defrosting. One of the things you notice is there's no defrost button on this unit like there is on certain microwaves where they have an auto defrost unit set setting. No, you, got, you, you can make your own defrost setting by using steam at a nice low temperature to give you even consistent defrosting, right? Without any worry that you're going to cook your food even the slightest bit, right? You know how microwaves do that, right? Some microwaves, they like to kind of quasi cook the food and you get that kind of weird, like rubbery texture to it. I never like that. So what's a great way to defrost your food is to use your convection steam oven as your defrosting tool. How do you do that? Well, you first start by lowering the temperature in the steam mode to somewhere between 90 and 110 degrees, okay? 90 to 110. Right? Pick any temperature in there uh, that you like. So maybe we'll just select 105. So you can see now we're at 105 degrees. I know I'm in the steam mode, right? So now I want to lock that temperature in for this process, right? I would touch the enter button and now I have steam at 110. All right. Now I want to move to the next choice of how to program the oven and I move one box to the right by touching the little arrow key, and that illuminates this box, and it says above it, set duration. So let's talk about timing in this oven. In the convection steam oven, you have two ways to time your cooking processes. The first way is located on the front panel. It says timer, right? That timer is simply like any other countdown timer that you would have on any other form of ovens, whether it's a large format oven or it's maybe on your, on your range. You're going to touch that timer. You're going to set the time. You're going to press start and it's going to count down. When it gets to the end, it's going to chime and say, there you go. It's done. You know, the timer's going off, right? Not going to have anything to do with the oven. It's just an independent timer. So you can use it for anything. The duration setting, however, interfaces directly with the operation of the oven. So if I set a duration as my timer, it's basically telling the oven, do this for this long at this temperature and then turn yourself off. So if I set a duration, right, in the oven, it will do it for, it will do whatever I'm telling it to do for exactly that long and then it will stop doing it, right? It will turn itself off automatically, which is great when you're doing a defrost setting because it allows you to control how the food is defrosting and keeping you mindful that you have food that is defrosting in the oven. So in this case, I want to set a time that is very easy to remember. So use a time that is a round number. Question. Why would I defrost in the CSO over a microwave? So it's a great question. Is that the question is, why would I defrost something in my convection steam oven versus in my microwave? Okay. First reason is one, it'll never cook the food. Microwave defrosting can be, I think, very imprecise. You have to know exactly the weight of the food that you are defrosting in order to defrost it properly. Because if you overestimate the weight and yet it's, young, it's, it's a lesser weight than that, the microwave power will be too great and it will begin to cook the food because the microwave is defrosting from the inside out, right? So it's basically taking the moisture inside the food and it's pulling it out, right? So if it's too, if you've overguessed the weight or you've overestimated the weight, now it's going to pull too much moisture out and you're going to get a little bit of a cooked item as opposed to a defrosted item, right? That's the first thing. I find that microwave don't really differentiate between a thick part of a piece of meat or fish or poultry um, versus a thinner part, right? It just tries to defrost uniformly, like it just goes across the board. So this part's going to be more defrosted than this part. So this part could still either be partially frozen, or again, this is the part that could cook. The beauty of the CSO is when you defrost in the convection steam oven, one, you won't ever cook anything at 105 degrees. You can't cook it. It's never going to cook. Two, when the when the, as that defrosting is happening from the outside in, right? It's a much more uniform, gentle process. It's not pulling the moisture out. It's simply softening it. So you don't get as much moisture if that was inside the meat being pulled out. So you get a 
better piece of proteins usually, right? Um, without drying it out, without extracting moisture from it. So you get a better product, right? You get less purge, you get less water. You can defrost in the bags, right? You don't have to put it in any kind of, you can literally just, if you have chicken that came in a plastic wrapper or a container of some type, you know, those plastic bag things, you can literally just put the bag right onto one of these racks, right? And it will defrost uniformly. And will it be as fast as a defrost in a microwave? No, it won't. It'll be a little, take a little bit longer. But if I know that my food won't be cooked and I'll have a better, more uniform piece of whatever I'm defrosting, that's why I choose to use this to defrost instead of a microwave. I just find microwave defrosting to be a very imprecise science. I never get it. It never comes out the way I hope it will. Whereas with this, I get a very uniform defrosting setting. Um, and so I get a, a much more even and um, better piece of protein when it comes out. So I want you to set a duration to make a defrost setting by simply choosing a time that's easy to remember. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, something that you can do e easy increments of, right? In most cases, if I have four chicken breasts that I want to defrost in the oven, it's not going to take 15 minutes. It's going to take longer than that. But I'm not worried that if I do, you know, a 30 minute defrost in here, one, it's not hot enough to make anything cook. I'm not going to be growing any sort of foreign substances in my chicken. I'm not going to make anybody sick. It's a completely safe. So I just set it to an easy time to remember. In this case, it's 15 minutes. I lock that time in by touching enter. So now what do I have? I have a steam setting at 105 degrees for 15 minutes. In order to save that for the future, what I would like you to do is touch the favorites button. And you touch the favorites button, it opens up a brand new screen. And it's gonna open up on this first little icon which has a heart shape and a one. That's the first open slot of your favorites button. What do you use the favorites for? You save processes that you know you're going to repeat in the future. Maybe you have a fantastic recipe for double chocolate chunk cookies and you find that, boy, if I use convection humid at 365 degrees for 13 minutes, I get a perfect cookie every single time, right? Once you know that and you're going to make those cookies repeat on repeat, you can, you can program that in to one of these favorites buttons so you don't have to remember how you cooked it. You just walk up and hit favorites. There it is double chocolate chunk, you hit that and it just bakes your cookies exactly the way you want it to. So you can always remember, you don't have, it's always remembering for you. Yep. Oh, I thought you had a question. Sorry. Um, so to save my defrost settings, it's going to open up to the very first slot. There are 24 slots, right? Want to open up number one by touching enter. And then I can type the name in, I can write defrost, or if you're like me and you don't want to go through the whole process with spelling defrost, the beauty of the word defrost is the first three letters are right in a row. So D, E, F, right? So now I know that's my defrost button. I back up to the little checkbox. And when I touch enter, that saves it. It's always going to ask me, would you like to run this favorite now? If you do, you touch yes. If you don't, you just touch no, and now it's saved. So every time I want to walk in there and defrost something, I simply hit my, if I turn, I come in, I turn on my oven, touch favorites. Ah, there's defrost right there. Touch enter, boom, off it goes. And now I have defrosting my food. Um, and it's always saved. So you have a defrost button that's always saved. You can do that with any process. You always write the process first and then save it. You can't open up a thing and then write it into the, the, the box. You have to write the process and then save it in the favorites button. But it's really a helpful thing to have. So that steam setting, right, at that low temperature, that's really what you're going to use the steam at a lower temperature for. Um, you can do it for sous vide cooking, although there is a sous vide mode, so you don't really need to use steam for sous vide in this particular unit, but for defrosting and that nice low temperature range is great for defrosting food. I really do find it works fantastically well. Um, you could also warm things up in the, using the steam as well and that low temperatures, but mostly what you're going to use that steam setting for is between somewhere between 
about 175 and 210 degrees for doing your seafood, for doing your vegetables, doing all those things. It's a great way to cook there. All right. Okay. Any more questions about steam? Does it? Yes. Can I keep the water in the tank when I'm not using it? Great question. So the question is keeping the water in the tank. You can leave the water in the tank all the time. You don't need to change it every single time you use the oven, right? You don't. Now, the only time I would recommend that you empty the, the reservoir and dry it out and leave it is when you're going away for a couple of weeks. If you're going to be out of the home, you're not going to be using the oven for an extended period of time, two weeks, something like that, then yes, drain it, wash the reservoir, reinsert it dry back into the oven until you get home and you're going to use it again. But during the week, if you're using it on Monday and then you don't use it again till Wednesday, and then maybe you use it on Thursday, but then again, not till Saturday, the water's not going to go bad on you and spoil in here, right? It's not. So you can keep the water in there all the time. You just need to fill it and keep it, you know, nice and full. If you know you're going to have a long steaming process where you're going to use a lot of water, add more water. But if you know you're only going to do a quick, you know, seven or eight minute steam, then you don't need to have a really full reservoir. You just fill it as you need it. Every once in a while, you will notice when you take the reservoir out, you'll look inside that reservoir and you'll say, why does my water look a little bit cloudy? All right. Well, let's just talk about how this oven works in that sense. The water is pumped from the reservoir into the boiler, right? When you call for a steam uh, mode, it boils that water, right? It dispenses the steam into the oven, right? In some cases, it doesn't need a full boiler, right? To make enough steam and you're done. So then there's a little bit of residual water in the boiler, right? We don't store water in the boiler when the oven is not functioning. We pump the water back into the reservoir and we do that after we're done steaming. Well, every once in a while, there's a little bit of lime scale that'll be in your boiler, right? That'll go back into the reservoir when the water is returned to the reservoir for storage. So that's why sometimes you'll notice in your reservoir, it'll look a little bit cloudy. It's perfectly safe. It's utterly harmless. It's just like a tea kettle you have on the stove. It gets a little lime scale sometimes in the bottom of it. It's not going to impact the, the flavor of the water or anything like that, but you'll notice that every once in a while, which is why like maybe once a week, if you're using the oven fairly frequently, it's a good idea to wash the inside of the reservoir. Just clean it out, wash it in the sink, warm soapy water. Don't put it in the dishwasher because that'll ruin the stainless on the front, right? You want to just wash it in the sink, clean it out, and then put it back in and then you can refill it as you need it. But you can store water in there all the time unless you're going to be out of the home for a pro prolonged period of time. You don't have to worry about that at all. Okay. Uh, any other questions about steam at this point? No. All right. So let's talk about those other cooking modes. Convection, right? What's convection heat? Just like every other wolf convection oven, it's just dry air, dry, hot air. Temperatures between 90 degrees, which is a low temperature for an oven, right? 90 to 440 degrees. So you have a very wide temperature range, but it's just dry air. And as you probably noticed when I talked about the interior of the oven before, it's a single fan, which means the air is moving in a singular direction, right? So unlike our larger format ovens, which have two convection fans, with a single fan in here, you get a singular direction of air movement. So full disclosure, right? If you bake something in this back left-hand corner of the oven in convection mode, just convection mode, then you will notice that that back left-hand corner will brown just a little bit more. But we use convection for dry environment cooking and baking. So cookies, biscuits, things that don't really benefit from steam. Things, items that are, we're extracting moisture from something, right? Like baking a cake, or maybe we're making some cookies or uh, some kind of baked good where we're trying to take that moisture out to the exact degree that we would like in order to have a nicely finished product. So we use con the convection for that, right? You can just use convection for that whenever you want a little extra browning, um, when you want that nice uh, uh, you know, caramelization on something, then you might want to just use plain convection because steam won't really benefit the cooking, right? Um, so that's what we use convection for. Again, with convection, you can use um, single tray, rack position two, but if you want to do multiple trays in convection mode, you're going to bake on rack positions one and three. And the oven will tell you that as you open up to use it. Convection mode is the only mode 
in the oven where I recommend that you preheat the oven prior to inserting the food. The other modes, steam, convection steam, convection humid, reheat, and sous vide do not require preheating, right? They just don't require it. But convection mode, because you would never take a regular format oven and just throw your cookies in it and then turn the oven on. You would definitely preheat it and then insert the cookies. Same thing's gonna be true here. When you're in convection mode, preheat the oven, okay? And it's very, very quick. I mean, you're talking about 350 degrees in this oven to preheat, it's like five minutes. It's not very long. One rule that I do like to apply when using convection mode in this oven is that you can use a lower temperature than you might use in a larger format oven. That's a two, there's twofold reason for that. First rule is that convection in its pure convection so you can definitely use a slightly lower temperature that your recipe might call for, but also it's a smaller oven cavity. It's a more compact oven cavity, so you don't need as much heat to get very similar results. So I very, very frequently um, lower the temperature in the oven by about 20 degrees in order to compensate for the size of the oven cavity and the convection fan in this oven. Just take that recipe, drop it anywhere between 10 and 25 degrees, somewhere in that ballpark, and you'll find that you'll get very, very nice results. Um, with the convection system in this oven, all right? Okay, so let's talk about the modes that really make this oven this oven, which are the combination modes, the modes where steam and convection are used together in order to give you the greatest results um, with the oven. The first one of those modes is convection steam. That's right here in the middle. It's the third box over. Convection steam, right, is always got steam and convection heat for the entirety of the oven process. 68% humidity, roughly 60, 65% in that ballpark. So it's adding enough steam, right? That you have about a 68% humidity factor in the oven cavity with temperatures up to 440 degrees, right? So between 180 and 440 degrees with steam present throughout the cooking process, right? So as we've kind of discussed at the very beginning, because steam is more efficient at transferring heat from the oven to the food, right? When using steam, you should, one, expect far faster cooking times. Two, expect you can use lower temperatures and achieve optimal results at a lower temperature because of the addition of steam and the efficiency that it provides. So again, much like convection, as a mode, you can use temperatures 10 to 25 degrees lower than your recipe might call for, but you should always expect that food should take 20 to 30% less time to cook, right, in that, in that particular mode. So the steam is always present, so you gotta make sure there's water in the reservoir, and it will then um, inject that steam throughout the cooking process, which will not only moisturize the food, but obviously make it cook a little bit faster. Now that's a very wide temperature range, so you can use it for a lot of different processes. So the way I've always divided it up is I look at that temperature range and I divide it into three separate zones, low, medium, high. The low temperature range between the low end of the spectrum, 180 to 275 degrees, right? It's about a hundred degree range, right? That's a great mode for doing all of your slow and slow protein meat processes. Things like brisket, uh, shanks, pork shoulders, uh, pot roast, anywhere where you want something to cook nice and slowly in a very moisture rich environment, right? That's the ideal way to cook um, in the convection steam oven. You can cook that and expect food to take a considerably shorter amount of time. So if you have a recipe for say beef short ribs and the average braising time in your regular oven was four and a half to five hours, you can easily get that done in the convection steam oven at about 265 degrees using convection steam, somewhere between three and a three and a half hour time frame, right? So that you get a nice moist piece of uh, beef but also it's cooking much, much faster because the steam is so efficient at softening and tenderizing that meat. So the steam is doing all that work for you. Now, when you're using convection steam, 
you never cover the food. You want to expose the food to the steam. That's why you're cooking in the convection steam mode. You want that steam to be present across. So in those low and slow processes, you don't need as much moisture in the pan around the food. You're braising liquid. You don't need as much of that because the, the oven is going to add a certain amount of steam as well. Okay, so low and slow, tender, juicy, moist pieces in less time using the convection steam oven. Great for ribs, right? If you like to do some ribs, right? You can do some nice, uh, you know, baby back ribs or St. Louis style ribs in about an hour and 15 minutes and they come off falling off the bone, but lots of flavor. If you want to glaze them under the broiler or on the grill or on a flat top or on the griddle, you can certainly do that as well. All right. The other thing you can use that low temperature setting for in the convection steam oven is doing some of those dishes that you might normally have prepared in a water bath. Custards, cheesecakes, flan, creme caramel, creme brulee, all of those items that you might have normally put into a water bath, let them cook in a regular oven until they were nice and set, given that little insulation factor from the water. In the convection steam oven, you can do the same thing. Don't need a water bath. You just literally line up those dishes on one of the solid trays. What I like to do is put a layer of, now don't get nervous about this, but you can put plastic wrap over it, all right? Don't worry, the plastic wrap will not melt. It will not get into your food. It won't create any kind of, you know, dangerous toxins in your, because it's not hot enough, right? So you wrap that tray with the plastic. You put the, plas the tray right into the oven. You let it bake at say 225 degrees in convection steam mode. You have beautifully set uh, custards and cheesecakes and flans and all of those things without hassling with water baths. Things don't crack because you have this moisture in the oven, which is insulating. So you don't get that dry air, which is what causes a lot of those recipes to crack and to come out uh, not the way that you want it to. So please uh, just use it for that um, as a, a great mode for those uh, those processes. All right. Okay. The middle temperature range, which is 275 to 375, right? This is for just general proteins and vegetables that you're roasting where you're not breading anything. You're not going for like the heavy crispiness or dark browning of something like that. You just want a nicely roasted pork tenderloin, or maybe you're going to roast some chicken breasts, but you don't need, they're not breaded and anything like that, but you just want to get them nice and beautifully roasted. This is the temperature range for that. So 275 to 375. Again, you don't need to preheat the oven. Just insert the food right into it and let it cook. Use your temperature probe in order to ensure that you get an ideal internal temperature for your food. Now this probe comes with your oven. It has a black cladding on the exterior, right? Don't get it confused with the temperature probe that may have come with an M series or E series or dual fuel range oven, right? They, they look similar, but, and they will fit into the ovens, but they won't work across both platforms. So you have to use the black one in your CSO. All right. So use that in order to make sure that you have a great internal temperature, an ideal internal temperature for whatever it is you're roasting. And in order to set the temperature probe on the oven, you simply open up that particular cooking mode. In this case, convection steam. I want, instead of setting the temperature, I'm going to back up one screen, a box to right here where it says set food probe temperature. When I touch enter, that's going to allow me to set my food probe temperature when I insert my food probe. Now my food probe goes here on the right hand side of the oven. You just open up that little door, you plug it in, and then you insert as much of this probe as you possibly can into the food. Do not just insert the first inch and a half to two inches of the probe in the food, because what's going to happen is the oven is, the probe is going to read the temperature of this exposed portion and the oven's going to say, oh, hey, your rack of lamb, it's done in seven and a half minutes because it's gone from 60 degrees, right? When you put it into the oven to 135 degrees because it's reading this right? Not the tip. So the tip is only about 70 degrees. So your lamb is essentially raw, right? So you want to insert as much of that in there and then that will give you an accurate reading of whatever it is you're cooking and you can set it 
along this scale anywhere you want, right? Just in single degree increments. So let's say you were gonna do, you know, something that would require a nice medium rare piece of beef, you might set it somewhere around 138 degrees. So once it's set to 138, the oven will cook to that exact temperature. You don't even need a timer at this point. You simply need to know that your oven is going to cook it to that internal temperature. Once it reaches that internal temperature, the, the oven will chime. What it will not do is turn itself off. It's not gonna stop cooking just because it reached that temperature. We have a mode for that. But once it's done that, then you can turn the oven off, take the food out, let it rest, and you've got it served. So use your temperature probe in that middle range of temperatures for um, convection steam. Again, 275, 375. Um, if you want a little extra browning on those items that you're roasting, then raise the temperature a little bit. But if you want to just cook it nice and evenly and stuff like that, you can always lower the temperature because it'll cook nice and evenly because of the steam and because of that uniform convection heat that's moving through the oven, right? So that's what we use that middle temperature range for. Again, lower the temperature slightly, just like in convection mode, you can lower the temperature slightly, but always expect your food to be cooked faster. And when you use the temperature probe, that'll become very evident to you because you'll see how quickly it'll cook. This chicken that we roasted here um, took about 48 minutes to cook um, from start to finish, from cold into the oven and roasted to a beautiful 158 degrees and then it carried up to about 165. All right, the last temperature range in convection steam mode is, two, is 375, pardon me, to 440 degrees. What do I use that high temperature range for? I use it for any piece of protein that I've breaded, right? So if I've got some breaded chicken cutlets that I'm gonna make chicken Parmesan in, I don't need to fry those up in a pan. I can literally spread those breaded chicken cutlets right on this rack place this rack in the oven above the solid rack at 425 degrees. In about seven minutes, I have beautifully baked crispy chicken cutlets that I could then top with my, my marinara and maybe my other cheeses to make my own chicken Parmesan. So you use it when you want to get something beautiful and crispy, beautiful and golden brown on the outside. It's also a perfect way for roasting your vegetables. So if you love roasted Brussels sprouts, if you love rust, roasted uh, butternut squash cubes, or maybe you love some roasted fingerling potatoes, something like that, this is the mode you wanna use in order to cook those vegetables and get them nice and crispy and golden brown on the outside. Now, you don't need to preheat the oven, and this is why. If I take my potatoes and I spread them across this tray and I wanna roast them, I place them into the oven, right? The oven is off, I turn it on, I set it to 425 degrees. As that oven is heating up to 425 degrees, the steam is constantly present. That steam is essentially steaming your potatoes to get them soft and tender on the inside. But then once the oven hits that higher temperature, boom, now we start roasting. Now we start getting the color and you've got a beautiful tender potato on the inside with a crispy exterior. So that's why you don't need to preheat the oven because the steam is doing that work while the oven is reaching its temperature, right? This is an ideal way for those of you who love to cook bacon and you wanna cook it in the oven so you don't get the splatter all over your stove. Literally, take your bacon, lay it on this tray, place it in the oven, right? Set your oven to convection steam, 440 degrees, right? And then turn the oven on. By the time the oven reaches 440 degrees, your bacon is cooked, right? And you can just decide whether you want it a little more crispy, you leave it in a little bit longer, but if it's the way you like it, you can just take it out. But literally, it's a great way to cook bacon in your oven because even though there's steam present, it's not gonna make your bacon soggy, it's actually going to get crispy because the heat takes over, the convection takes over, and that's what makes the food crispy. But the steam has done the job of cooking it and keeping it moist and tender on the inside. So it works great for bacon as well, just so you know, because I get that question a lot, people. How do you cook the bacon? Do you do it on the stove? Do you do it in the oven? I like to do it in the CSO, okay? So that's a quick way to cook bacon in the oven. So again, use your convection steam setting for a myriad of things, but that higher end is always when you want something crispy, when you've got it breaded, or you wanna roast your vegetables and give them all that flavor and all that caramelized flavor, that's when you wanna use the convection steam setting at that high, high temperature between 375 and 440 degrees, okay? All right. Convection humid, funny name. What's convection humid mean? Convection humid, there's steam in the oven cavity, but the reservoir can be empty because 
What convection humid does is it uses the, the, the inherent moisture in the dish that is being prepared to create the steam in the oven. In other words, the oven's not producing steam. It's simply not allowing the steam that is produced by the food that is being cooked to leave the oven. So it retains all that moisture around the food that is being prepared. What do we use convection humid for? We use it for items that are naturally moist when they go into the oven. So anything made with a batter, right, is a great muffins, uh, bunt cakes, things like that, perfect in convection humid. Want to keep it moist, they're very moist when they go in. We want to retain some of that moisture. We want it to bake nicely and evenly. We use convection humid for that. You can roast your chicken in convection humid because it's retaining a lot of that moisture while still allowing, I don't know if you guys can see this, let me just turn this around really fast, but how nicely crispy that chicken skin has gotten while we were roasting. We had all the mushrooms and potatoes around the outside while we were roasting in convection humid as well. So it works really nicely when you're roasting something that has a nice skin on it and you want to get it crispy while retaining that moisture. So convection humid is used for those types of items, right? Using convection humid retains moisture, doesn't add extra moisture. Um, and you don't need to add moisture to muffins, but you don't want to dry your muffins out. So we want to save as much of that moisture in the oven as possible um, when we're baking in convection humid. All right. Now, one of the other modes, again, that you don't cook in, in this oven is reheat, right? Reheat mode, right? Reheat mode is a combination mode, just like convection steam. A little bit of steam, a little bit of dry air to reheat your food, right? If you're using reheat mode in a manual way, you're just to saying, okay, I've got a few plates, I want to reheat them. Um, how do I set the temperature appropriately? Well, it's pretty easy. Um, the beauty of the reheat mode in, in this oven versus say a microwave is I can put a rack here in number three. I can put a rack here in number one. And then if my plates are the right size, I could actually put four plates in there simultaneously and reheat them, right? Using the reheat mode. And when I check the reheat mode, it tells you that I, you know, what racks to use like always. And then it shows you it's 250 degrees. Because you don't need you to reheat food at 350 degrees because then you're just cooking it twice. 250, not doing a lot of cooking, right? In a quick, short amount of time at 250. So that's why it limits the temperature to 250. The oven adjusts the steam because the whole process behind reheating is refresh the food with steam, then reheat it with the dry air at 250 degrees. So you get nicely refreshed, moisturized food, and then it's reheated. So again, using reheat, um, is a great way to do it when you're just trying to reheat something in. If you're thinking about timing it, right? Remember that it's probably going to take a plate, a full plate of food. It'll take about seven to nine minutes to reheat it, but it'll be evenly and consistently reheated. It won't be just the green beans got hot and the chicken didn't and the mashed potatoes are literally stone cold. Um, you're not going to have to worry about that. It's going to reheat very evenly again because of steam around the food, it's going to reheat in a much more even and consistent manner. Now, for those of you who are a little apprehensive about reheating in there, because you're like, well, I don't know how long it's going to take and how am I going to know? Here's a great shortcut for doing that. So let's just do this. So you can see all the buttons on your screen. Down here in the lower left corner is my favorite button on the oven. It's called the more button. Right? It's down here. The more button, as I like to very sort of jokingly say, is the sort of junk drawer button of the oven. In other words, it's the place where they put all the things they couldn't figure out another place to put them. Right? So the more button has all sorts of different things going on underneath it. Right? But one of it is when you touch more, you scroll over and it says auto reheat. Auto reheat is a great way to reheat something when you're just not sure how long it's going to take, but you do know how you would like it to reheat. And the nice part is there's only two choices. It's either very moist or it's a little bit crispy. So something crispy might be leftover chicken pot pie. Maybe you have some egg rolls or some wontons, right? That were crispy on the outside when you got them from the, from the restaurant, but now you want to re-crisp them and heat them up again. 
you can choose the crispy setting either one works whatever you'd like but if you're most likely going to be doing just a plate of leftovers that you'd like to reheat or maybe you have a bowl of mashed potatoes that you'd like to reheat without cooking them twice or putting them back on the stove you can use the auto reheat setting as well how does auto reheat work well the oven is taking in sort of processing everything that you're telling it the first thing you're telling it is you want to reheat something the second thing you're telling it by choosing either moist or crispy is how you would like it to be so if i choose something to be moist right i touch moist and now it tells me again which rack to put it on i touch enter one more time and what do you notice i can't set the temperature and it says right here it's going to take about 10 minutes to reheat whatever it is right so i place my food in the oven right i let it start right and what is the oven going to do it's going to start processing that information it knows i want to reheat it knows i want it moist what's it doing now it's determining how long that's going to take one of the unique features of this oven is that the sensor system in this oven is very sophisticated so now the oven knows two of the three things it needs to know in order to reheat whatever it is i'm reheating one it knows it want it moist and two i know it knows i want to reheat it all it needs to know is how much is in there well you don't have to put it in there because the oven's going to figure that out the way it does that when i start enter it takes a temperature of the internal temperature of the cavity of the oven it then raises that temperature a certain number of degrees by calculating the time it took to go from temperature one to temperature two, it can give a rough, rough estimation of the mass of the food that needs to be reheated. Now it knows everything it needs to know. What I'm doing, how I want it, how much there is. It will then spit out a number, which I guarantee you will be faster than the number that it originally estimated it towards, and then it will reheat my food automatically to the degree of doneness that I would like it to be done. So we call this feature the more gourmet feature, right? It exists not only in the reheating modes, but also in some of the other cooking modes, which I will get to in just a minute. But just know that the sensor in this oven is very, very sophisticated and it works like a charm. So if you are unsure of how long it's gonna to take to reheat those four plates of whatever it is you're reheating, right? Just load those plates in there, go to the more button, go to auto reheat, choose either moist or crispy, and let the oven do the rest of it for you. And I think you'll be very pleasantly surprised at the results because it really does work beautifully. Remembering that whenever we're reheating, same process applies. Steam to refresh, heat to, re to, to reinvigorate the heat part of it. So, okay? Hope that helps with your reheating section, all right? The last of the quick start modes is sous vide, right? For those of you who are interested in sous vide cooking, and that's not everybody, I get it. Not everybody is gonna spend seven and a half hours cooking pork chops at 139 degrees, right? So they can get the perfect pork chop. But remember how sous vide works, right? Sous vide uses steam at the precise temperature at which you would like to serve that item, right? to cook it fully throughout, right? Which would then allow you either prior to the sous vide process or after the sous vide process to brown or sear that item so that your interior temperature is ideal for how you would like to serve it. And then you can finish the outside very quickly on a hot surface, whether it's a grill or a pan or a griddle, wherever you might like to. So in the sous vide mode, it uses steam and a slow turning convection fan in order to precisely cook food that is sealed in some form of a vacuum bag, or it can be a Ziploc bag. It can be a reusable silicone bag, but that's how sous vide works. You get the internal temperature exact because remember that food can never exceed the temperature of the environment in which it is cooked. So if I set the internal temperature of my oven to 135 degrees, my ribeye steak can never exceed 135 degrees. And so the longer that I cook it at 135 degrees, even though it will never
get hotter than 135, in other words, it will never be more than medium rare, it will get more and more tender the longer I cook it. So I use sous vide for that pre-cooking items so then they can be finished, like I said, on the stove, on the grill, whatever it might be. But the sous vide mode will allow you to take recipes that are written for sous vide cookers and translate them directly from the recipe to the oven. You don't have to make any adjustments between what a circulator might do on your stove or on your countertop versus how the sous vide mode in the oven will cook the food. It, it's going to be a one-to-one -one translation between those two recipes. So if you are interested in sous vide cooking and you have some documentation on that, whether it's recipes off the internet or in a cookbook or whatever it might be, you can transfer it right over to the convection steam oven and do sous vide cooking um, in the oven um, if, you, if, you, uh, if you choose to. Um, and like I said, you don't have to use a, a vacuum bag. I think it's beneficial, but you can use a Ziploc bag. Again, not hot enough to melt the plastic. You know, it's just not hot enough. Because the highest the sous vide will go is 185 degrees. Can't cook anything hotter than 185 in sous vide. That's the maximum temperature in sous vide cooking. Okay? Um, if anybody is interested in sous vide cooking, there's some great uh, websites out there that can really help you with doing it. So in terms of times and temperatures to get degrees of doneness, whether you're sous vide eggs, um, you know, if you want to make like uh, soft boiled eggs in the shell, you can sous vide them um, in the oven and, and they're part, you can get them however you like it, whether the yolk is runny or set, whatever you want. It's, there's a lot of great uh, stuff on the internet for um, sous vide cooking if you're interested in that. Okay, so those are all the quick start menus. That's when you do the determining of how do I want to cook it? How hot do I want to cook it? How long do I want to cook it? But there's another way to cook in this oven, which is the gourmet mode. And the gourmet mode is much like the other gourmet modes in a wolf oven, which is there are processes built into the oven that will say, here's what, a way we know how to cook this, or here's a great recommendation for that. The great thing about the convection steam oven is that there are 150 plus processes in the oven. Now, for you to learn all 158 processes, you would literally have to walk up to the oven, touch the gourmet button, and then scroll through all the different ways, right? This could be very tedious and time consuming and quite frankly, uh, it would be boring, right? But we're gonna send you a list in that email of all of those processes that are in the oven. It has a little piece of chicken on it there. Um, this document that you're going to receive has the, mo the, the, the gourmet features listed exactly as they would appear were you to scroll through the entire processes on the oven. So if you open up gourmet, the first category is vegetables. The first vegetable is leaf spinach. And then it just follows through all the way down for six pages, right, on this document, which you can see everything it can do. What this, each column lists how the oven would cook that item, the temperature at which it would cook that item, and the duration of that cooking process, right, um, to do that particular item. So in the case of leaf spinach, it's going to steam it at 210 degrees for 10 minutes, right? Give you beautifully wilted spinach. So if you're making recipes with like a, if you're making a spinach dip and you want to use fresh spinach and not that horrible frozen stuff, um, then you could just steam your own spinach and then you'll have it ready to go um, just for that, right? So it'll, but it'll cook it fully. It's not like this is like prep times for the, for the, whoever asked about, you know, blanching vegetables. This is longer than just a quick blanch or something that you might want to saute or something like that. This is a fully cooked vegetable. So you'll notice the times are appropriate there. But as it follows through, it goes all the way through. And then this last column over here on my extreme left is whether or not the oven requires preheating or not. And if you'll see as you go through the gourmet modes, probably only about 10% of the time will you need to preheat the oven. Right? And it's mostly in the baked goods section that you're going to find that preheating is going to be required of that. But the gourmet features are there, right? Now, in some cases, the gourmet feature, right, for a particular item might have more than one way to cook that particular item. A great example would be, say, chicken breasts. So if I come over here to page two, where the chicken breast section is, if I look, I have chicken breast. There's two different ways to cook it. The first way is simply steaming my chicken breasts, 
for 15 minutes at 210 degrees. Why would I steam chicken breasts? Well, if I want a really moist chicken salad, then I might want to steam my chicken breast, right? But if I wanted to roast my chicken breast, right, and give it a little more flavor and a little more color, there is a second alternative, and that is the convection steam mode, and that tells you which temperature it will be cooking at, for how long, and then it tells you that in that particular instance, it would like you to preheat the oven prior to inserting the chicken breasts. So it gives you all the documentation right there on the oven, or you can look on this document to see how everything will cook. Now, in certain cases, you'll see it in the, the mode of cooking. It'll say there's that more gourmet setting, much like the auto reheat setting. And again, what the more gourmet setting means is that the, if you're cooking, say, a potato gratin or scallop potatoes, and you want to use the more gourmet mode, the oven will not allow you to adjust the temperature nor choose how the oven will cook it. You'll simply be asked, how would you like it to look at the end? Right? It knows what you're cooking, scallop potatoes, and then you tell it how you would like to look at the end, and then it does the rest of the work for you by figuring out the mass of the food and then applying appropriate temperature, mode, and then therefore time that it will take to cook it. So whenever you see a more gourmet setting in here, know that the oven is going to simply ask you the question of how would you like it to look at the end? And then you'll program it according to how you would like it to look, and then the oven will cook it for you, all right? So it's a really great thing to use the gourmet settings in your oven. There's everything from, you know, if you're baking a pizza, you're making a vegetable gratin, you're making lasagna, maybe you're gonna steam some rice, right? You wanna steam rice, right? It'll literally walk you through. Question. It's, you don't want to place a pan on the floor of the oven. Simply place the, the solid pan in rack position number one and your perforated pans above it. In, if you have more than one perforated pan, you could go two and three and four if you're steaming. But you definitely want to place the solid pan in number one simply because it will catch the, the, the excess liquid. By placing it on the floor, it interrupts a little bit of the heat transfer from the floor of the oven. So you definitely want to place this just in rack position one when you are steaming and then everything else above it, right? I hope that helps uh, with that, all right? So again, with the gourmet settings, um, you're gonna, f I would recommend that you just start experimenting with them. You know, if you, if you look on there and you think, boy, I'd really, you know, I've got some fresh salmon that I'd like to um, cook. Do I want to steam it or do I want to kind of roast it using convection? It's got some programs in there for that. Maybe you want to hard boil some eggs to make a lovely salad here in these warmer days. You're making a nice chef salad and you want to hard cook some eggs. Simply go to the gourmet section and use the eggs button and the hard cook setting. You will literally place the eggs on this rack. Right? You don't need anything else, just put the eggs on the rack. You can actually do up to 32 eggs at the same time, right? Place them on there, select eggs, hard cooked, start. It will perfectly hard boil your eggs. Just take them out of the oven, place them into a basin of ice water to stop the cooking process. I've never had an egg come out with a greenish gray yolk around. They're always beautiful yellow nice and creamy on the inside. They're really perfectly cooked and you don't get a lot of cracked. I mean, I've very rarely do the eggs actually crack during the cooking process. It's really a great way to hard boil eggs. And there's a soft cook method there as well if you want something with a little bit less. And then you have some extensive baked goods items. Now you notice this loaf of, these loaves of bread that I have here in front of me, these are, um, baked entirely in the convection steam oven um, using one of the bread baking modes in the oven. There are multiple ways to cook uh, bread in the oven depending on what type of bread you're cooking. Um, this bread used the bread mode, which is number one under baked goods. Um, but you'll notice that when you open that up, you'll see that there are actually four different categories under baking a loaf of bread. Um, each one um, uses a slightly different 
way of cooking bread or baking bread so that you get the, the, the finish that you would like. In this case, these two loaves were baked using that more gourmet setting where I simply tell the oven I'm baking a loaf of bread. I would like the crust as dark as you can make it and you figure out the rest. And that's exactly what it did. I simply literally made these loaves yesterday afternoon. I let them rise um, uh, during the day. Then I formed the loaves, put them into baskets, um, and refrigerated those loaves overnight so that they had a very slow fermentation overnight in my refrigerator. Then I simply lined a tray like this with a piece of parchment paper, turned my loaves out onto this tray, slashed the top with a razor blade, and used the more gourmet setting for that darkest setting, and this was what I got. Right? I didn't have to do anything. I didn't have to worry about how the steam was injected or the temperature of the oven. The oven did all the work for me. So that's one way you can bake a loaf of bread. If you are a slightly more accomplished bread baker and you'd like to adjust temperature and time, you can do that using an auto steam bake feature because that auto steam bake feature will basically dispense the steam to the oven, right? You can adjust temperature and time, but the oven will take care of the steam part of it. So auto steam bake is great if you have a little more experience. And then remember that the other way to bake bread in this oven is using the convection steam mode, right? Which I think as you guys all remember, that's steam 100% of the time during the baking process. The problem with that is that if you have a nice artisan loaf like this, right, that's got, you know, a fairly high gluten content flour in it, if you inject steam throughout the cooking process, that crust is going to be like iron, right, because that steam is going to harden that crust because it's through that, that, there throughout the process. So we use the bake mode, convection steam mode for baking bread when we have low gluten uh, percentage flours, like rye flour, spelt flour, items that are softer wheat, softer flours that require more steam in order to develop a crust. So if you are baking bread in this convection steam oven, I do recommend for everybody to use either auto steam bake or more gourmet. Best way to bake bread in the oven um, when you're doing a regular loaf, if you're doing things like challah, brioche, uh, one of those enriched bread, cinnamon raisin bread, something with a lot of butter and, and milk and things like that, then you might want to use the braided bread section down below it because that's lower temperatures, a little bit less steam, softer crusts, all that kind of good stuff. But it's all basically laid out here. It tells you exactly how the oven functions in that mode. Um, it'll walk you through it. Um, and then there's a lot of other baked goods in there. There's cookies, there's tarts, pastries, cakes, quick breads, right? If you're making banana bread, zucchini bread here in the summer, you can use the quick bread setting. Again, that's a nice, um, more gourmet setting for your quick breads. It'll just do all the work for you. All you just tell it how you want it finished at the end. So lots of things in that gourmet setting. Yes, another question. How would you cook rice? How would I cook rice? So best way to cook rice, if you want to steam rice, right, in the oven, you want to just make just like some fresh white rice, Maybe you're making, uh, or you want to cook it a day ahead. Maybe you're going to make some fried rice tomorrow and you'd like to cook the rice ahead. You simply go to, in the gourmet settings, just use the dry rice uh, under, it's under side dishes and you'll see there's a dry rice setting for it. When you scroll through the dry rice setting, well here, I'll do it right here on the counter, up here. Let's just go back to that. Side dishes, there we go. Let's scroll over to dry rice. So it's going to tell you you want to cook rice. It's going to steam it for you. So as you scroll across, it tells you you're not going to preheat. You want to do it on a single tray, right? Single rack of rice, single tray. Now you're going to get a couple of things that they call gourmet tips. And if you highlight the gourmet tip and then you open it up with the enter button, it'll tell you for every one cup of rice, and these are white rices, not brown rice, but white rice you want to use one and a quarter cups of liquid, right? So whether you're using broth, whether you're using water, um, anything, but you want to do a one and a quarter to one cup ratio for white rices, basmati, jasmine, uh, long grain rice, any of those rices, white rices, that's a great ratio to use in the oven. 
So once you mix those together in, I like to use like a nine by 13 pan or smaller pan, a nice deep sided vessel, combine those ingredients in there. You can add salt if you want, or if you want to add a little bit of fat, maybe it's olive oil, butter, coconut oil, whatever you like, you can pop that in there as well, right? The next gourmet tip is we want you to put that food in that vessel and then you want to place that vessel on the wire shelf in rack position number two, okay? So once you've got it in there, you touch enter and the rice will steam. It'll take about 30 minutes, right? I like to let it sit in the oven after it's been steamed for those 30 minutes. Let it sit for just a minute, then come back in about two, three minutes with a fork and just stir it gently. And that's a great way to cook rice. If you're interested in cooking brown rice, quinoa, amaranth, any of those items, um, if uh, you are interested in that, I can send you a chart which gives you equivalence for cooking those. Brown rice takes obviously a lot longer. The, the, you know, the, the water ratio is a little bit different, but that dry rice in the gourmet mode is designed for white rices and it works beautifully well. I've had best success with basmati has been my most successful um, rice cooking in here. It always comes out beautifully, uh, individualized grains. It's really, really nice way to cook rice. Um, so you can do it, definitely do it when you're doing prep, uh, you know, if you're cooking rice ahead, all of those things. Okay, that answer that question for you, I hope. All right, so again, using all these steam uh, gourmet methods, really, really helpful way to learn how your oven, for lack of a better term, thinks. This is basically how your oven thinks to operate. And once you start doing some of these things um, with the gourmet mode, I think you'll start developing a feel for how the oven cooks. Now, remember I said that most of these items are under the gourmet button here. But as you get down to the end of your, this document that we're gonna send you, you're gonna see one of these boxes in uh, orange, it says more gourmet. So again, those are located under the more button, right? So right here is where the more button picks up. And when you touch that more button, you have this right here says more gourmet. Now this gets very confusing, I realize that. What it really should say is additional gourmet, which is just additional gourmet processes are under this more gourmet button. And when you open that up, you see you've got all sorts of cool things under there. Fresh appetizers, frozen appetizers, souffle, frozen potatoes, frozen pizza. You want to bake a pie. You want to make some muffins. All of those things are located under that more gourmet button. The cool thing about all those frozen items, frozen appetizers, frozen uh, potatoes, frozen pizza, is that it assumes, the oven assumes, that you purchased that item and the item came in a box which gave you directions which say bake at X temperature for X number of minutes, okay? You don't have to remember the temperature that the box told you. You simply need to remember the time the box told you to cook it because what the oven is going to ask you is how long did the box tell you? Because you just told it, I'm gonna cook some frozen potatoes and the packaging says bake at 375 for 22 minutes. All you need to remember is the 22 minutes because you've told again the oven frozen potatoes. It assumes you want them to be crispy and brown. So it will make up the rest using that whole more gourmet function because you told it the package directions. Same thing is true for a frozen pizza. Same thing would be true for frozen appetizers. For those of you who might have young children in your lives who demand chicken nuggets on a regular basis, a chicken nugget is essentially a frozen appetizer. So if you wanna make your child perfect frozen chicken nuggets, you can simply provide them with, just give them this tray, spread out the chicken nuggets, pop this in the oven, frozen appetizers, pick the appropriate package time. There's only three choices in terms of the time it says, and then hit that number and voila, it'll bake it for you and roast it for you perfectly. Get them nice and crispy and brown. Same thing is true with potatoes. Um, frozen pizza is still frozen pizza, so it'll be as good as it can be, um, but it's a great way if you're absolutely starving and have nothing else to eat, you can cook a frozen pizza in here. Know that because there are frozen apps, frozen pizza, frozen potatoes, there are fresh equivalents of those as well, right? Fresh potatoes cook differently than frozen potatoes. 
fresh appetizers cook differently than frozen, frozen appetizers, and the same thing would be true for a fresh pizza. It's all going to cook a little bit differently. Um, the frozen appetizer button is kind of a nice way to, to be able to plan things in this oven, and the gourmet mode helps you with this in that, let's say I'm having a dinner party, and I would like to have my appetizers be done very close to the time when my guests were arriving so that they could have nice hot hors d'oeuvres when they arrived. So what would I do? I would go to that frozen appetizer button. I would arrange my frozen appetizers on the tray. I would touch enter. The packaging might say on my frozen appetizers, bake for 18 minutes at 375 degrees. I would choose the appropriate time, 18 to in this case, 13 to 20 minutes, I would touch enter, pick my rack position, and now I would scroll to this very last box here where it says set end. If I open that up, if I touch enter on touch end, I take, if as long as I have the right amount of time, I can set my end time to be done at the exact time I want it to come out of the oven. So if my guests today are arriving at 6 p.m. and I would like my hors d'oeuvres ready at 5.55 p.m., I could set my end time for exactly 5.55 p.m., then touch enter. The oven would wait the appropriate amount of time before it started the oven to bake those appetizers to be done at exactly 5.55 p.m. Right? So that's a great feature that you can use by being able to program the, the, uh, the oven to tell it exactly when you want it done. And you can do that anywhere. <laughs> the crazy part is you can program up to 24 hours in the future. Well, I don't think you're going to leave something in the oven for 23 hours and then cook it for the last hour or whatever. But you can definitely program so that it'll be done at that exact time when you would like it to be done, right? This is also the way one of the other great features, and I just want to go through this because I think this will be really helpful for everybody, is this mode right here, it's under again, the more button, and you come down here, it's the slow roast mode. And in slow roast mode, right, I use my probe in conjunction with the oven's programmability to do a slow roasted item, whether it's a leg of lamb, it's roasted pork loin, it's a prime rib of beef, it's beef tenderloin. And I want to make sure that that, of, that item is done to the exact internal temperature that I want it to be done to and done at the exact moment that I want to serve it. All right. So in that slow roast mode, I simply select the type of meat that I would like to roast. Beef is probably the most common. So we'll pick tenderloin. I would select tenderloin. Then I would select my degree of doneness. In this case, let's select rare. It tells me which rack position to use. So it tells me that I would want to use my probe. It'll be set to 131 degrees for a rare piece. If I don't think that's rare enough, I can make that lower. So I could take it down to say 128. Touch enter. Notice I cannot set the temperature of my oven. I then scroll over to the duration setting. The duration for that slow roasting process can be anywhere as short as two and a half hours or as long as four and a half hours, right? But it has to be within that time frame. It cannot be done in an hour and a half. You can only do it in these parameters, two and a half to four and a half hours. You choose. My recommendation to you is this. If you are slow roasting items in this oven, then I would recommend the longer you can roast it, the better the quality of the product will be at the end. Three and a half hours is a nice time for a tenderloin. You could do a little bit longer if you want, but I wouldn't do much shorter than three hours. I would keep it longer if I can. But I can set that temperature, or the time, excuse me. So now I've got my temperature set for an internal temperature. My roasting time is three and a half hours. Now I can set my end time to anywhere from right now to three and a half hours in the, so three and a half hours in the future from right now is the minimum. Then I can do it longer, right? If I, if I want to say I want it done, you know, if I'm, it's one o'clock in the afternoon, I've got errands to run, I can set up my oven so that it'll roast it, like it'll start while I'm away, um, and it'll roast it to the exact internal temperature that you like, right? The beauty of this oven is that when it reaches that internal temperature and it's finished its roasting process, it will turn the oven off, 
but it will hold that piece of meat for an indefinite period of time at the exact temperature that you asked it to be held to without overcooking it. All you have to do is simply leave the probe inserted in the oven and into the meat and just leave it in the oven and just let it hold. So if you're having a dinner party, you planned to have it done at 7.30, but you were having such a lovely time with your guests that you didn't, you kind of got behind a little bit and all of a sudden you realize it's 10 to 8 and your, your roast was done at 7.30, so it's been sitting for 20 minutes. Don't worry, it hasn't overcooked, it hasn't dried out, it hasn't gotten cold, it's been held at that temperature by the oven in a nice, moist, consistent, stable environment so that when you're ready to serve it, all you do is take it out of the oven and slice it. There is no resting needed on your part. The oven will rest it for you when you use that slow roasting mode. So it's a great way to plan a, plan a menu around the cooking of that particular item so that you can time everything to that, right? So everything else can be applied to that instead of just waiting for the roast to be done and hoping that your potatoes didn't get cold or whatever it is. No, you don't have to worry about that. The roast will be done exactly when you want it to be done, okay? All right. There's a lot in that gourmet feature. Um, I, when you get this document um, in the email, I think it'll really help you. So you won't have to be scrolling through every single thing in order to find out what your oven can do, but it's all there for you. So you can check that out. Um, when you get it. Um, okay. It does a lot of other things, which I, I could go into it, but we're not, but you can can in this oven. So if you want to do some canning, you can't do pressure canning, but if you're steaming items, I mean, if you're pressure, if you're canning uh, jams, jellies, things like that, you can do that in the oven. What you really can't do in here for canning is things like meats, poultry, things like that. Can't really do that because those require a pressure canner. Um, can't do that in here, but for things with a fairly uh, good, stable, acidic pH level, then you can definitely do that. So jams, jellies, relishes, mustards, things like that can easily be done in here in the sanitizing mode. Um, it has a lot of other features in there that most people don't use that often, but you might find that they will work for you. There's some spa modes in there for, for different things. Um, so it's, uh, it's really versatile in that sense. Okay. Talk about taking care of this oven. There's only two things you have to do to take care of this oven. One, you have to clean it out periodically, the inside, and two, you're going to have to descale it depending on how often you use the oven and the hardness of your water. Um, usually it's like once every nine to 14 months. So it's not very often. So the descaling is a very easy process because the oven will tell you when it needs to be descaled. But let's just talk about basic cleaning and taking care of it when we're using the oven. All right. When you use the oven, there is steam that is produced. A lot of times the, as the excess water will condense. That water will condense and it will end up on the floor of your oven. So you are going to want to have a towel available or a rag so that when there is a little bit of water here on the floor of your oven, you simply can wipe it out because you don't want to leave water on the floor because the heating element underneath the oven floor of the oven when it's used the next time will boil that liquid away and if there was any food residue in that water it'll stick to the floor of your oven. All that means is you're going to have to clean it a little more aggressively the next time but why not just wipe off that water and not have to worry about it the next time so it's always a good idea if there's a little of residual water on the floor of the oven just wipe it down when you're done. That's very very basic right? But if you've used the oven extensively over the course of a week and you're noticing that there's a slight discoloration to the walls, there's a little bit of grease on things, maybe it's on the door and you're thinking, okay, I need to do a little more cleaning of the oven. Well, here's what I first want you to do is I want you to remove these side rails by simply unscrewing these thumb screws. Take these out. Don't put this in the dishwasher, but these racks are stainless steel and they can go in the dishwasher. So put those in the dishwasher, put this in a safe place. Then when those are removed, close the oven door, quick start, steam, pure steam, 210 degrees, about 15, 20 minutes. Just steam that oven nice and clean, right? That steam's going to wash the walls. It's going to loosen all the stuff that's on those surfaces in there. Going to get it nice and easy to clean, all right? Once it's finished steaming, I want you to turn it off. You want you to open the door, let that excess steam leave the oven. All right, let it out. Now, 
I'm only five feet, nine inches tall. This is impossible. I cannot touch the back of the oven when the door is open like this. I can't reach it. Standing on a step stool makes this very, very difficult, hard to clean. So we thought of a way to solve that. This is the only appliance that we make that you can take the door off of. How do I take the door off of? The oven, I extend the door so it's fully flat. And then I look at the two hinges that are located here at the back. I'm gonna flip, there's two clips, one on each hinge. I'm gonna flip those forward till they stop naturally. They'll only come to about a 45 degree angle. I'm gonna lift the oven door till it runs into those clips. So you can see it's at a nice angle like this. We call this the resting angle. I want you to grip the door on the sides. I want you to lift it up and off the front of your oven. Set it off to the side. Now I'm gonna have an oven here that's gonna have all that residual water in there from the steaming. So there's gonna be a fair amount of water on the floor. That's okay. There's gonna be a fair amount of water on the ceilings and on the side walls. All right. These two products are completely acceptable for cleaning out the interior of your oven. The Barkeeper's Friend or the Bon Ami. I would not recommend to you using Comet or Ajax because those abrasives are far more abrasive than either one of these are, okay? I like the Barkeeper's Friend because it's, I just like it, all right? This is the other thing, you can't, you have, you can't skimp on this, you can't change this. You have to use a blue or pink Scotch-Brite scouring pad. So it's blue sponge, blue scouring pad on this side, all right? You have to use this. No green. You can't use green Scotch-Brite on your Wolf Sub-Zero Cove appliances because then you'll scratch them. And once you've scratched stainless steel, well, you know, it doesn't go away, right? And someone's always going to notice. Okay. Take this. Sprinkle it in the water that's residual on the floor of your oven. Take your sponge, make a paste, scrub the interior of the oven, right? Now this oven is brand new, so it's pretty clean, right? Scrub it down really, really well. All the sides, the ceiling, everything. It's a sealed cavity. It's not like the water's running down underneath anything, right? It's sealed, right? So scrub it all the way down, then take a clean towel, come back, wet it down, wipe down all the residual cleanser, right? Get it cleaned out. Now you're gonna put the oven door back on, all right? This is very important. When you put the oven door back on, it goes on in exactly the same position it was when it came off. So it goes on at an angle just like that. You'll feel it click in, right? Then you'll extend it downwards. You'll close the clips. And if you choose to, you don't have to do this part. You can close it again. You can run steam for like two, three minutes just to kind of rinse it. If you will come back with your clean towel again, wipe it down one more time. Take your clean racks, your side rails, there's two holes in the back, fit it on there, screw this on, and now it's nice and clean. That's all you have to do. You're gonna see other methods of cleaning this oven that involve things like no fume easy off and stuff like that. There is no reason to be spraying all sorts of chemicals in here to clean it. I, this literally will take you five minutes. It's longer to steam it than it is to clean it. And with the door coming off, it's super easy to clean. If you need to clean the interior of the door, again, a little bit of Barkeeper's Friend, little blue Scotch-Brite, give it a nice scrubbing, wipe it down. You wanna make it shiny and look perfect. Take a little non-ammoniated window cleaner, spray it down, microfiber cloth, wipe it off, voila, very clean. You don't even take a razor blade to this because that steam really helps keep everything nice and clean, okay? All right, that's how you take care of the interior. When your oven needs to be descaled, you will get a message in the window that says, your oven needs to be scaled. Would you like to descale it now? Yes, no. If you're in the middle of making Thanksgiving dinner, I would recommend you type no, right? Because if you type yes, you're gonna have to spend about 45 minutes descaling the appliance. 
The beauty of the wolf is when you need to descale it, you can delay it if you need to. It's not, it's not imperative that you descale it at that exact moment, but you can skip it. So what you're going to do is you're going to get a bottle of the Dorgol Swiss steamer cleaner. It's available through us here at Roth Living, or you can go on to um, Great Plains Factory Appliance Parts. They can sell it to you as well. Um, uh, Sub-Zero will ship it to you, I'm sure. Um, but really easy if you're here in Denver or if you're at any one of our showrooms around uh, the greater upper Midwest, just pop into a showroom, Kansas City, Salt Lake City, uh, St. Louis or Minneapolis, we all stock the Durgol cleaner. It's just for the CSO. You're going to pour that contents of that bottle into your reservoir. You'll start stop. You'll hit start. It'll, it'll rinse your reservoir. It'll clean it, scrub it out, scrub out the boiler, get all that lime scale out. It takes about a half an hour, 35 minutes. Once that's done, it'll tell you to empty the reservoir. You'll pour that down the drain. You'll fill the reservoir with clean, cold water. You'll do that twice and run it through to rinse the system. Voila, you're done. That's all you have to do. Very easy to maintain. Again, it's a probably every nine to 14 months. It's going to depend on A, the hardness of your water and B, how frequently you use the oven. For those of you who live in places where you have very hard water, you can adjust the water hardness in the settings key right here. The settings buttons allow you to change languages, adjust your display, the brightness, adjust your clock, configure you know, whatever notifications there. It'll allow you to descale manually if you want to. And right there is your water hardness button, right? For most people who live on a municipal water system, medium hardness is more than good. If you have softened water in your home, you're gonna set the water to softened. If you live in a remote area with a very deep well and you don't you know, you don't treat the water at all. That water could be a little bit harder. So you might want to set the water to be a little bit um, at the harder end of the scale. Um, it's not going to impact the way the oven functions. It's simply going to help regulate how many times you need to descale it in order to maintain it. That's all it's going to do. The oven will function in the same way, regardless of water hardness settings. It's simply going to change how frequently you have to descale it. Okay, so you have a lot of other settings in here that you can change the, you know, the loudness and all sorts of stuff like that is in your settings, but, but it's pretty, most people don't have to change much of it except for that water hardness setting. That's going to be the thing you're going to change most often. Okay. Um, and do you have any more questions there, Lynn, from behind the scenes? All right. Okay. Well, know that we do, um, when we send out the email, if you have a question that you come up with in the interim between now and when you get the email, feel free to reach out. Um, whether it's to myself or to Lynn or to anybody here at the Denver showroom, we're certainly more than happy to help you out um, with any um, uh, you know, questions you have regarding the convection steam oven or any of the other Sub-Zero Wolf or Cove appliances that you might own and be using currently in your home. But I will tell you right now, this is one of those ovens that once you get used to it, once you start using it, you are going to use this oven so frequently it, you're going to wonder how you ever live without it. So um, I would encourage you to use those gourmet settings, you know, get a sense of what your oven is all about. Just remember that in most cases, you can lower that temperature, shorten that cooking time. The oven's going to give you a superior product in, with both of those things changed. You're going to find that it's going to be a really superior product. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today um, and helping us christen, uh, you know, this kitchen as we've just finished it here in the last few weeks. We're really excited to uh, be coming to you live um, today. And so we look forward